Hi everybody. Firstly, I wanted to thank you for attending the webinar today to discuss the very interesting subject of sustainable design for a circular economy. My name is Marie Williams. I am a senior charter engineer within the Institute of Mechanical Engineers and also the CEO and founder of G Networks, which is a social enterprise within the UK. So firstly, I want to talk about what is wrong with our current economic model and why should we look towards a circular economy? Our current model is a linear model. We get the raw materials, we extract that, and are then able to manufacture products that we do use. And then typically all of the materials are just non-recyclable and used as waste, put in landfills. So no loop back to for reuse or recycling. This is a challenge because 9% of all materials are currently recycled back into the economy, which means over 90% are going to waste. Within the built environment, the built environment consumes more than 50% of all metals within the UK. Capital equipment, so high value products and, and uh, machinery, consumes almost 50% of all global materials annually and generates around 20% of our global greenhouse gas emissions. 62% of global greenhouse gas emissions are emitted during the extraction, processing and production of goods in a manufacturing process. So in a really challenging position right now, and we have to start thinking about how does that look for the materials themselves. Firstly, we're going to look at plastics. This is quite a shocking image, and it's looking at a shoreline in the Philippines and looking at all of the single-use plastics which have been collated within that shoreline. Currently, the World Economic Forum predict that if we continue to produce and have the amount of waste that we currently have, and if these trends continue, by 2050, there could be more plastic in the ocean than fishes, which is a startling fact, but a very true fact. And currently, 90% of all used plastics become waste. Now, looking at the built environment, an environment which is all around us, which we're all very aware of, currently accounts for 20% of all global greenhouse gas emissions and consumes around 33 billion tonnes of materials every year. And by 2050, it's predicted that the European building stock will have grown by 30% and the Chinese building stock will have grown by 135%. So as we're continuing to build, we're obviously going to have more and more materials that are wasteful and that's going to encourage more and more global emissions, both in consumption and in waste. Currently, solely just 1% of all reclaimed materials are used in the new building projects. So a lot of the materials that are used for the built environment are actually new. Then looking at food, a topic that's very close to all of our hearts. Farms, manufacturers, consumers, um, currently these core business, businesses that are facing customers contribute to 58% of all food waste, and that's around 8% of all our greenhouse gas emissions. If we look at how and where the food is wasted, currently around 15 million tonnes of food is wasted in the UK annually. This is a report that was provided in 2014. Um, you can see one of the really key areas that have a big challenge is actually household waste. Within the Institute of Mechanical Engineers, we've done great work looking at global waste and the supply chain and where we actually are losing food. So almost 1.3 billion tonnes of food is lost along the um, food supply chain. That's, that was reported by the UN Food and Agriculture Organization. And this is a key challenge, not just locally, but internationally. Some, there's some key areas we know are the causes of this loss, such as lack of refrigeration and cooling systems in more developing countries as they're trans, transporting the food. So to look at the reuse economy, the reuse economy is different to the linear economy in that it has the loop back for recycling products. So products we know well, such as um, plastics or maybe even glass bottles. The circular economy is quite significantly different. The circular economy goes beyond end of life products in terms of trying to see how we can recycle to the use of the byproducts, such as things like steel slag for cement, for making and laying of roads and pavements. So how can we use all the resources and all the materials 
um, that have been put in for use, how can we extend their life so that they can continuously be used in a circular loop fashion. So this quote is quite good, that I, or I like it quite a lot, it's from RAP, circular economy keeps resources in use for as long as possible, extracts the maximum value from them whilst in use, then, recover, then is able to recover and regenerate products and materials at the end of each service life. So that's the dream of the circular economy. So that's what it is. But in terms of their core principles, there's seven core principles which I'll take you through. For the first being the ability to prioritise the use of resources, resources which are regenerative, which are um, not non-renewable, which we believe are going to be able to regenerate during the whole circular process. Being able to design for the future, so considering when we're designing products, um, what is the carbon footprint which is going to occur at the end of its life? Incorporate incorporating digital technology, which I'll go through in more detail when we, I go through case studies, but how can we use digital technology to inform our consumption patterns, know how much we do need to produce? We think in the business model, so it is more circular, and it considers how do we use regenerative materials and regenerative products, preserve and extending what has already been made, so how much can we really get out of that material and that product? How can it be reused? Um, use waste as a resource, so again, how can we reuse what we deem to be waste as a resource, either by using it in the same form as it is and using it made in a different country, or how can we completely redesign it and reuse it from that waste? And lastly, collaborating to create a joint value. So you've looked at the why and the what, so now we're going to look at the how. So there are six core principles which I typically like to use for the circular economy, and actually it's quite a world-renowned um, take on the how of the circular economy. So that's looking at the recycling sector, what can the recycling sector do to encourage um, a more circular economy? How can we reuse products and repair them so that we extend their life? What is the role of the user? What is the role of the retailer? How do we redesign the product so it's easier to get more out of its life, and it also reduces the waste footprint from that product? and also looking at the manufacturer themselves and the manufacturing process. In terms of co-design, key person to look at is the user. So what role does the user have in the process of creating something that is circular in the economy? So that brings me to the question of what is the role of co-design in sustainably designing for the future? So looking at co-design, so the classical theory, which um, is typically used in design or engineering design process, is that we have the users, which is the man with a U on his shirt, um, or even a female, the user. The researcher will look at that user and also look at past research, understand what is the user's needs, and get more insight. From that insight, they may generate a report, and then it will be the job of the designer or the engineer to then design a solution. The co-design enable design to be a more democratic process by believing not just the researcher and the user should be involved in the design process, but everyone should be together, the user, the designer, the um, engineer, or the researcher, and bringing tools together that enable them to design a solution collectively. In terms of our product design process, because the code design requires much more research in terms of engaging with the user, I, this image shows a fuzzy front end. The reason it's fuzzy is because we're giving ourselves time to be able to explore different scenarios, listen to the user, understand their needs, understand their behaviours and their patterns, and from that generate design criteria or design requirements, and from then being able to create ideas, concepts, prototype, and create a product which we believe will actually meet the user's needs and give a better shape to the future. A, a summary that I like to use for co-design is to say co-designing is a way to deliver a solution that recognises that the user themselves has expert knowledge and must be integrated into the design process to be able to sustainably solve the problem and produce a product or service that is adopted and actually used. So what I'm now going to do is go through three case studies. The first case study will be in the built environment and it's looking about looking at how we can redesign for clear economic benefit. So this case study will look at how the actual business has been able to rethink the business model, use waste as a resource, and collaborate to create joint value. Mark Edwards, the UK's Green Building Accounts Sustainability Officer as of 2016, 
said that collaboration within the construction industry is crucial to ensuring that businesses can embed best practice and overcome barriers to apply circular economy principles to the built environment. So hopefully this case study I'm going to show you will highlight how important it is to collaborate within the circular economy. Cleveland Steel and Tubes Limited, a company based in North Yorkshire, who use repurposed steel tubes sourced typically from oil and gas industries to provide steel tubes for other industries. They typically collect five types of tubes which are recovered, treated and later distributed. These include concrete coated tubes, plastic coated, epoxy coated, butane coated and uncoated. Within the tubes that they collect, it's very important that first of all they're able to remove the coating, then obviously make sure they have a responsible process for disposing of the coating, stocking it for resale, fabricating it and later distributing it as I mentioned before. A key important factor of their business model is that all of their materials are based on using waste material from the oil and gas industries. In the independent research which was conducted to look at the carbon saving generated through their process showed that 96% of carbon saving occurred from using repurposed CTC pipes, which have been generated from repurposed steel. This particular case study, which is quite a new case study from Cleveland, has shown how important it is to collaborate. So Cleveland were able to work with two different organisations within their industrial park to be able to use waste material. They used material from a portal frame in a council project produced by Severfield UK to be able to produce a new warehouse for NTS. By being able to use these repurposed or waste material from the frame, they were able to save NTS 300,000 in the cost of their steel frame. Not just that, 20,000 tons of road planings were able to be used from a motorway upgrade for the foundations of the new warehouse. So the company were able to speak to the people who were doing the motorway upgrade. And before the new foundations were put in place, they were able to use the material from the upgrade of the road and repurpose it to be used for the foundations. Cleveland Steel and Tubes Limited are also challenging the current building standards EN1090 for more clarity in terms of the building safety standards required for repurposed steel. By challenging these building standards, they're hoping that more people will feel comfortable to adopt waste steel. Our next case study is looking at the public health and how we can break down silos. This particular model looks at how you can rethink the business model and also how you can preserve and extend what is already made or produced. Kaiser Permanent, which is a healthcare facility, and Kahilo partnered on a pilot initially to test out their system of having shared equipment ownership in five facilities within the USA. Currently, the program includes five million members and almost 50 medical centers across several hundred locations across the US. So the pilot obviously it went extremely well because it's expanded significantly. Currently, over the last two years, the hospitals have been said to have saved over 8.6 million over just two years. So looking at the product itself, Tahilo provides a cloud-based software that enables hospitals to firstly book equipment within close proximity, but also rent out their own equipment. So really encouraging that whole sharing economy. Also providing on-demand access to enable the hospitals to see every asset within their system. To provide alerts, so whether there's been new equipment or new technology within close proximity of the range of hospitals that are working together, they're able to know that new equipment is there and then later rent it and share it. And lastly, they run usage reports so the hospitals themselves can see how effectively they're using the equipment they own and how much they're sharing. And they can also view predictive analysis. So this model is really a great model in terms of looking how you can use data to be able to share material and potentially not only save costs, but reduce the amount of products that are required. So last but not least, when looking at plastics, and look at how, how we can think about plastics to be more than recycling and instead of how we can have longer life cycles for plastics. So 
So similar to others, it includes rethinking the business model, then it looks at using race as a resource, and then how can we really design for the future? Within the UK, we currently have a past its pact for 2025, but we believe together we can enable 100% of all plastic packaging to be reused, recycled or composted, then 70% of all plastic packaging to be effectively recycled or composted, and hoping that 30% average overall of recycled content across all plastic packaging. This equates a total reuse potential of over 20% throughout the plastic packaging market. This is a big aim that we believe collectively we can achieve. So when I say we, that's not just the users, it's the, it's the manufacturers, it's the retailers, it's the people within the supply chain looking at how we can really reuse the amount of plastic packaging we have. In 2020, the Australian government performed robust and significant amount of research looking at the use of single-use HTPE plastic bags. And their research found that if we had 10 bags a trip each week for a year, so that equates to 520 plastic bags, there will be an embedded energy consumption of 210 megajoules, that's equal to 6.6 .6 litres of gas and emissions of 6 kilograms of CO2. This is very significant. Currently, within the UK, the sales of single-use HTP carrier bags has dropped by around 86% in major supermarkets since our levy has been introduced. That's the levy of paying an extra 5p for every single-use um, single bag you buy in the supermarket. This, according to the parliamentary report produced in October 2018, has resulted in 1.3 billion plastic bags being taken out of circulation over a period of two years. So that's, a, in my opinion, a really great result. The key thing that we need to consider is that it requires a levy to be introduced. So it requires the user to change their buying patterns and the levy enable this to occur. If you look at the diagram on your left, you see that for one plastic bag that is reused three times, it creates to nine uses of a paper bag, 12 uses of a bag for life, and 393 uses of a cotton bag. So actually, you, by you reusing the bag three times, the carbon footprint is significantly reduced. Corp has also gone a bit further and looks at how can we really redesign the whole bag in, in general, and are replacing the single-use plastic HTPE carrier bag with lightweight compostable alternatives that they believe will be able to be reused and be biodegradable bags for food waste. During this presentation, we've looked at our current economic model and looked at the linear model, the reuse model, and the circular economy model. We've looked at waste and how we can sustainably design for the future by trying to co-design together and try to be more collaborative and try to adopt more of the principles that are elements of circular economy. But is it really that simple? One of the key things I think we need to make sure we do is we really address the causes and not just the symptoms. So any solutions we are trying to address, how can we address the manufacturing process itself? How can we address the extraction of the materials as opposed to after the, post, after the product has been used and is already out there as a produced product and we're then trying to recycle, reuse it? How can we first of all look at the root problem by just reducing waste and reducing consumption? Another key thing is that we really need to challenge the perceptions of the different stakeholders. What is their perception of the quality of waste material? What is their perception of the, using offcuts or what is deemed to be waste steel tubes? If this tube is safe, if it, if it is good quality, why are we not using it? Why are we not using more waste? Why are we not using more reclaimed materials? And then also, we need to really consider that a significant amount of time and financial investment is required to consider and create these solutions. If we're going to work with the users to understand their buying patterns, to understand their consumption patterns, we're going to need to do research, we're going to need to gather the data, we need to take up the time to work with them. And we need to be ready to financially invest in the materials and the systems and the data connection, collection processes that are required to create more regenerative products and processes. We've heard the challenges, we've heard of potential solutions, but what role do we as engineers have to play to enable the circular economy to be effective and for us to achieve these great aims we have for the future? 
I would like to propose a toolkit for sustainable co-design for a circular economy. And within that toolkit, there are four key instruments that are required to enable us to be sustainable co-designers within the circular economy. The first one I'm going to look at is empathy. How are we able to listen to our users, listen to stakeholders, understand their needs, understand their motivation and their challenges, for us to understand what we need to do within the solutions to either reduce the waste or change the consumption patterns. Similar to empathy, we also need to look at collaboration, collaborating. How can we work not just to listen to stakeholders or users, but how can we collaborate together? How can we understand each other's requirements and how can we create mutual value in our solutions? A key factor to enable this is data. We need to use data as a tool. A, a data could be used as a tool for knowledge exchange. It can be used as a tool to be able to create more robust evidence for why we need to change our patterns. And we could also use data to be able to fuel a new technology, such as the technology that was produced and shown in the public health case study. And as I've been talking about technology, the very last instrument is technology. As engineers, we, we believe in technology, we use technology every day, but how can we use digital technology? How can we use mechanical technology to enable more effective and robust co-design products to be produced for our circular economy. Lastly, I just want to say thank you very much for listening to me and I'm very happy to answer any questions you may have. Hi, I just want to say thank you again for listening. Um, so I'm just going to look at the questions we have. We've got quite a few questions. I'd really encourage anyone else who has any more questions just to feel free to join them in. So the first one I'm going to look at is um, from Asis. Asis, hopefully I said your name correctly. You've written, I still see huge amount of plastic bags in supermarkets when it comes to carrying the loose vegetables. I always buy the loose vegetables and then they deliver them all in plastic bags. Is there any plan, any levy to tackle this too? So what I would say is, this is actually something that I definitely consider, <laughs> and um, I think quite a few of my family members have noticed how much I moan about things like this. And one thing I would say is looking at the UK Plastics Act, which I mentioned before. So um, this particular act really brings together, as I mentioned, brands, retailers, producers, local authority, businesses, um, and obviously within the producers, looking at even the grocery companies themselves, such as Asda um, and other bigger names, to say what can they do. So I think one thing, that would be, a key thing that would be done is within this UK Plastic Act Pact, where the organisations are working t together collectively, it's whether they will actually be able to notice to this to be a problem. And actually really do believe it is. One thing that I would say in terms of our part is the UK Plastic Act is, Pact is open for us to engage with. And I think partly it's to even try and see how we can lobby, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> lobby the government to say, okay, this is an obvious problem. You've got the UK Plastic Pact where everybody's working together to enable something to be collaborative and collectively done. So how can we action change? So I think that's the key area. The key way it can actually be changed is through things such as the UK Plastics Pact. Hopefully that's helped and feel free to ask me any other questions if you wish. There's another question from Brett Williams. So Brett Williams has said, what methodologies do you use to <coughs> achieve these savings um, and the changes, etc.? So you've suggested lean, agile, Six Sigma. Um, I won't go through them all in case the whole audience doesn't know what um, lean, agile and Six Sigma is. But what I would say is a lean model Sorry, my fault screen. I would say a lean model is very important to try how do we, when I say lean, I consider a lot in terms of the digital model of lean, so digital agile model in terms of developing software. How do you build something quickly or how do you iterate a potential intervention or solution quite quickly based on the data you have, um, understand a minimum viable product. So when we let's think of this example we just used just before, if the solution isn't just a levy, but it's maybe changing the material, how do you assess it in a very lean manner? So do we speak to a, um, a producer such as 
COP and say we've got this new technology, we want to t test it out to see if it will work, whether the users will be happy to um, engage with it, whether it will be able to um, hold as much apples as the apple plastic, mod, um, plastic bags, and how can we create a, a small production of this particular product, test it out and see whether people do agree with it. So I think a lean model in terms of thinking about what the digital software industry does and trying to put it into our industry, so mechanical engineering industry, to come up with more innovative solutions as engineers. And oh, more questions. <laughs> um, there's another question says, so Mark Flower says, do you see synergy? So Mark, I would, I would request if you could maybe, oh no, I've seen it, so I had to ex explain it out. Here we go. Mark Flower, how, how do you see energy generation from race materials fitting with the circuit economy? Or dual priority is to use regenerative resources. How do you balance using waste, which m may be seen as regenerative, for electricity generation, the verse mining more gas? <laughs> wow, Mark, that is a really good question. I'm going to just initially break it down. So when I think of um, the waste materials um, in the circular economy model, I think first of all, it's really important to think of what sector you're looking at. Are you looking at the built environment? Are you looking at um, aerospace? Are you looking at things such as the work that was done in the Gatwick Airport, so the North Terminal, where they're really trying to look at their race model and how are they going to reduce race by um, particularly, I'll give, actually, I'll, I might even use this example as the case study for my answer. So you may know of Gatwick's, um, the Gatwick model. What they've now done is they've said that all the race that they produced, that can't be recycled. What is going to be done to it? It's be now um, dried and turned into large pellets and into fuel um, into, for a biomass boiler. And then the energy generate, generated is used to um, power and heat the north terminal. So trying to do a circular economy, in-house circular economy. And I would say that's something that I think is really key. Trying to think of how can you create a loop that is quite small. So um, and also to scale. But within in Gatwick, they're their, their company, so an organization with infrastructure and the, the actual amount of um, different systems they have that they can think of how can I use race in one system and how can it fuel another area, it's really important for them to see how can they use that loop within their own um, let me use the word system again, their own system. So I think it's really important if when you can use a circular economy within your company or within the particular um, project that you're working on that enables the race to be much more efficiently managed. Another thing I remember that they had put in the Gatwick model is, is that they, for example, they said the water that's recovered from the drying process, they use it to clean the bins. So it seems quite simple, but it's great. And it, I think I remember it saved about 2.3 tons of water. Um, another thing that they did was the ash recovered from the biomass boiler was then used in making um, low carbon concrete. So again, that's even taking it a bit outside of their house um, and think what else can they do with their race? So I'm not sure if that helps. I think the key thing I'm trying to say is reduce the loop and think within this infrastructure, within the system, how can I be more circular? And I would think a key thing is not just comparing it to another um, another form of technology, for example, mining more gas. I think that's quite hard to compare against. But if you were going to compare against, I think I think a key thing was making sure you've got your numbers in place in terms of um, the energy efficiency, the energy that you're putting in to be able to create, to do things that are more regenerative compared to um, taking something that's more war. And generally it is, you're going to be saving a significant amount of energy and the carbon dioxide emissions are going to be reduced. So another question, I've got, I've got about 20 questions, so I'm going to see, this is perfect, because I was I, I made it quite short, the webinar, and I didn't know if it was going to be too short, but now I've got so many questions, it'll be great. Um, so I'm just going to do them first come and first serve, uh, forgive me. So now moving on to Jeremy's. Are you saying that the single-use plastic bags were better or worse than the other solutions? Okay, so you're, are you referring, you're referring to things such as the cotton bags? So I was looking at the LDPE plastic bag compared to things such as the cotton bags. So yeah, what I'm really trying to say is when you look at the actual, um, I'm just open it up to make sure I'm referring to exactly the right document, exactly the right number. One second. 
okay, I haven't I haven't got exactly numbers to me, but I will be able to call it. Um, when you look at what has been done in terms of the um, plastic bags, it's trying to say that for, I think it was about four, I haven't got them written in front of me, but for about four LDP plastic bags, um, it's equal to, I think, like nine of the heavier rate, um, or not so the 12 bags for life. And it is really just trying to say, yeah, the carbon footprint is reduced by using, um, reusing a single use LDPE, so low density polyphene um, bag compared to using the 12 um, bags for life or compared to using 393 cotton bags. And I think it's a really interesting fact that a lot of us don't actually know the actual carbon content or the um, carbon footprint is reduced compared in using reusing plastic bags. So the answer in summary is yes. <laughs> okay, go back into the questions. Right, so Kerry. Oh, Kerry Mashford. Um, question: Do you have examples of materials quality standards that enable use for recycled rather, rather than virgin materials? Insistent on virgin materials with real demonstrably chain of <laughs> insistence on virgin materials with demonstrable. Um, chain of a, of a customer is often a barrier to of use for recycled materials. So yeah, that's a really great question, and that's something that I think relates to the example um, that I gave for for the built environment. So one of the building standards that they're trying to address is the um, EN 1090, and that's really trying to say how can we um, within the standards bring to light that you can reuse materials that are. I guess in that example, it is recycled or it hasn't really, it's just been created and maybe it's an offcut and it's just basically raced. And particularly within the Cleveland steel and tubes, they're really trying to push that because that's really important. It's similar to things when you look at the UK plastic pact. If you have the government um, and the other bodies on board to ensure that you lobby a change that actually changes the policy or on our side, changes the standards that enables more people to feel comfortable and safe to be able to use these materials, then it's just going to be better for everybody and it will enable the circular economy to thrive. So I'd say, yes, that's really much more needed. I've given you that one example. That's the one I know that's a challenge. Um, I'm not sure of any other uh, materials quality standards that have changed, but um, maybe I can contact you separately and I can tell you more because I've got your email there. So um, James Russell, do you see low grade Plastic recycling, e.g., mixed plastic tubs, not bottles, best done locally, country of origin, or lower cost economies, with rigorous auditing to ensure that it is not just burnt up, dumped, <laughs> burnt or dumped despite promising of recycling. So, James, I also break this down just to make sure I've understood, understood this. Um, so, so, I think what you're trying to ask is where do I see it best done locally in terms of locally within the UK, and please let me know if that's not, if I'm not understanding this correctly, or um, in lower cost economies. Um, so when you say lower cost economies, are you maybe trying to refer to developing countries um, which potentially do not have a rigorous audit? So um, this is, I'm going to be, have to say, this gonna, I'm going to give you quite a subjective answer on this because I haven't looked at the data in detail on this side, <coughs> but I do work significantly in the continent of Africa and look at a lot of the work that's been done, particularly in the circular economy, trying to say um, how could we reuse plastics. And a key thing is that a lot of the plastics that they may have, and not just in um, the continent of Africa, but other regions, has been has come from places such as, um, it has come from Europe, it has come from America. And I think the key thing that we really do need to consider, which you highlighted there, is the fact that it really, really, really isn't, not only is the process not the best, but it isn't the cleanest and it definitely may not be the safest. Um, I think safe in terms of how they potentially will need to maybe, for example, burn the plastic or whatever forms of, um, whatever methodology they want to use to be able to disintegrate the plastic or use it for other methods. I think that's significantly a significant problem and also dumping it is a significant problem. Um, so when we, within ourselves, doing things our work locally and trying to say, okay, we're going to, as a user, so looking at ourselves as a user, what we're we going to try and do to be able to maybe reduce our 
amount of plastics we buy or try and reuse our plastics for um, we reuse our plastics more so um, it could be plastic bags it could be plastic containers to get from um, your local takeaway how can you reuse that I think in terms of lower grade plastic re recycling another key thing that really needs to be done is really tackling how we recycle so even looking at things such as the uh, milk bottles we have our milk bottles have not just milk bottles but other bottles um, it has about three different components in terms of plastic. So when you're going to recycle your plastic, or and if, it's, and if your milk bottle even has like um, a sticker on it, how many, how much things do you need to break apart? Do you need to take off? When I say stick, I mean the label. Just to take off the label, label. Then you do have to take over, take off the lid because that's a different form of plastic. And then also, obviously, the lid. Within the lid, there's a rim that has another form of plastic that's already still attached to the bottle itself. That is then maybe going to be um, sorted and processed, and that's uh, putting more and more energy into the system for recycling plastics. Um, so what I would say in terms of what I see, I think there's a lot of challenges, and I think a key thing is within us lo in terms of what we do locally is really challenging the design, and I think this is a place for us as engineers or designers, I recently looked at a new design for a plastic bottle, <laughs> a plastic milk bottle. <laughs> I complain about them a lot. Um, and I don't think it's really, I haven't really found one yet. Sometimes I don't think I should go back to using glass bottles. Um, but yeah, I would say that, as I, just in, in summary, that I would say that locally, I would say it's done quite well. We're trying to improve our um, sorting. We're trying to encourage more people to be able to recycle, but it's fundamentally there's a challenge with the design of it. And I would say in um, lower cost economies, I think there is definitely going to be challenges with materials in terms of it being burnt or dumped. I think we should also understand that within those um, developing countries that they are also very innovative and they use these plastics for um, to be able to even create infrastructure that um, not for buildings but I've seen I'm a playground designer so I've seen playgrounds um, structures made out of plastic bottles I'm not saying they're necessarily you'd assume they're the safest but it's more innovative things that can be done that actually do work um, that actually are really efficient and especially when you look beyond plastics and you see what developing countries are doing with other forms of materials to make it more circular so I really don't think I'll be able to go through all of them everybody I'll try my best so or maybe I'll be short on everyone's answers. So Michael, Michael Reed, is there any move to create incentives for bottle and other product package we use? Yeah, so this goes back to the um, UK's plastic pact. So yeah, from what I've been reading, I'm going to, I think I tried to get some more information this morning on it. Um, but from what I've been reading, they are trying to do more work. For example, they've, um, in terms of particularly how can they try and create more incentives for the bottle and um, other product package reuse? So they, one thing they've done is they've, as opposed to think about incentives from us as a user, so not just putting it in the hands of users, they've been looking a lot at the design. So this, for example, they've put in design, they've created design tips um, for making rigid plastic bottles um, and, rigid, and rigid plastic packaging more recyclable. So we're just trying to change the design and that's encouraging the manufacturers and designers. Um, also, another thing that I've been highlighting is within the packaging design, a guide to minimizing the environmental impacts. So I gave my, um, um, I talked about milk bottles for quite a lot of time, and I think there's some things such as this would en enable that to be improved, so the packaging design. Um, they've even tried to also look into the change in the process in terms of recycling and composting. So when they did the um, collecting and when they did the sorting, how can they improve that process? And I would even encourage them to not just improve the process, but how can they be more strict at, see, at looking at how efficient they currently are? I haven't really seen any incentives for actually um, us as the users improving our use of it. I haven't actually seen that in terms of like a monetary value. I'm assuming that they will be doing things for manufacturers, but I haven't seen particularly for users. So a question from Johnny Page. How do we create an internalized response to this, especially in response to the reduction in the current global rest to global east recycling process? Um, Johnny, unfortunately, I do not know that particular process so in terms of the reduction so what I would encourage you to do is if you ask the question and maybe tell me what that particularly um, what that actually is then I'll um, fast track your question and I'll go back and respond it so if you could just expand it a bit more that would really help okay another question um, so for Daphne 
How do you encourage uh, manufacturers to make products that last longer <coughs> when they need to when they need you to keep buying more new ones? <laughs> so I think this is a great question. We need um, challenges the the whole model um, or the challenges how we are in terms of us being quite consumeristic, and it also really challenges the requirement for behavioural change. Um, I think it's really obvious. Like the bottom line is that you you um, you sell more. You make more money, um, so I would say things. I, I now keep on going back to the um, UK plastic patch, but I think things such as that, and even as another example, um, it's called Refresh, and Refresh is um, t around 26 partners from around, I think, approximately 12 of the European countries, and also China are working together to see how they can um, reduce the sustainable address the sustainable development goal 12.3, um, and try and see how they can half the per capita food waste. Um, so just coming, to, I think people coming together and saying how they're going to collectively work on a particular issue so there's a certain amount of accountability can encourage manufacturers to really say, I know my bottom line looks better if people are buying more. But I've bought into a certain um, ethos or certain pact or certain um, goal and because I'm bought into that goal and I've worked and I'm working with others, I'm more encouraged to be able to do things that don't just focus on the bottom line being associated with with more sales. Because in reality, the bottom line is obviously associated with selling more, but you can also save money and that will improve the bottom line. So that's the key thing is looking at how they can save money. So how can they use more regenerative processes that save money? Um, how can they be more efficient? How can they cut out waste? How can they close with it loop within their own company, such as what was done in the in Gatwick Airport North Terminal? I think that's another way of looking at it. Okay, so another question from Andrew Hurens. So what about the theme of repair, e.g. Do domestic appliances that become that have become to be seen as disposable? Do you envision pressure being put on to manufacturers to design and make their products with repair in mind. <clears throat> so I'm obviously I'm going to be a bit not biased. I'm an engineer um, and I also like to design and make things. So I think great it would be great for more people to be able to repair and it will be it to be easy to repair. But I think the key a key challenge is looking at the user. So that's why really mentioned in the beginning and the whole most the whole process of co-design. I believe if your users are open to going to go through the repair process and they believe in the value of repairing as opposed to buying something else um, so sometimes the process of repairing can be something that is a deterrent for somebody compared to the fact that they can maybe just go online do something like a um, click and buy a new a new version um, sometimes that will might be your on a deal so they actually maybe they not even losing that much money so I think a really key thing is that I highlighted just in the previous answer is behavioural change. How do we actually change the behaviour of users so they're more willing to repair? So not assuming that everybody is open to repairing. A key thing, a key incentive that always seems to work is, you know, cost. So if there's, if it seems to be significant cost saving, then how can we encourage more people to repair? But also ease. So. Like I said, for manufacturers to be able to design something so it's easier to repair, I think that's, as an engineer, I think that's a really key thing for us to even look at. So what, how can manufacturers do that? How can they create more modular designs that are more flexible, more adaptable, um, and easier to just reconfigure if there is a problem with them? So I've discussed that theme in enough detail for you, Andrew. Um, so I've got, I've got 12 more questions to go through. <laughs> I try not to speak fast. Um, so Francis, should we keep the car for longer? What about kitchen appliances, freezer? Yeah, because I think it's back to what we just said, yeah. Um, my car, my, so I'm quite a personal person. My family have been telling me to get rid of my lovely Kia Picanto, which I bought for my sister uh, about five years ago, and it's been around for maybe 10, 12 years. For some time, I got a job um, maybe about three years ago working for a company that was really uh, quite a big company and a, quite a few of my employees I mean colleagues had much flasher cars than myself and I really just thought now I'm going to keep my car for longer I think it's really important to keep things for longer and believe that we can extend the life and again I'm going back to um, behavioral change and even think about 
the, what people's perception is. So if you keep your things for longer, how acceptable is it in society? And are you confident enough to say, I actually want to keep it for longer? And it actually still adds value. Um, and how do we really address the consume what the retailers are doing to try to maybe potentially encourage us to be to be cons more consumeristic and want to buy, 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 and not keep things for longer. So things such as even cars, when you can don't need to buy your car and you can, to an extent, rent your car. Um, so I think we should keep things for longer, but we also need to be, be able to change our behaviours in terms of things such as kitchen appliances, such as freezers. I think as long as it's um, safe and it's working well, then yeah, then we do keep it for longer. But I think it also goes back to Andrew's question: How easy is it to repair, and how access accessible is the repair process? If the freezer uh, was produced however many more years ago, is it easier? Is it quite easy to get somebody who can repair it? So just really trying to consider that for long. Consider that. So it is from Tom Pendry. Hi Tom. Um, a big part of a big part of changing how we as consumers use products is about the education on the education of the consumer and behavioural change, which is what we've just been talking about, which is great. <laughs> Where do you see these factors fitting into the product process, product design process? Great question. Um, so I won't really talk about behavioural change too much because we've been discussing that. Um, and behavioural change is, as it says on the tin, it just how do you change behaviours? Um, for me, I would say a key thing is within the product design process is really starting with the co-design process. So <laughs> thinking about who are going to be the user, so in the, who's going to be the user in whatever product you're producing. And when I say user, so who's the person who will be buying it and using it from day to day, but who also are the local state, stakeholders. And um, when I say not just local, but just the stakeholders for the particular product. So. Um, the person who be the retailer, um, the brand that might be endorsing it. How putting all of them in the whole, engaging them all in the design process, so it is a, a co-design process, and particularly starting from the very beginning. So if I had that image that looked, had like a fuzzy front end, and the, front, the fuzzy front end was addressing where you need to do quite a lot of user research, and user research thinks about the user and also considering what impacts users' behavior and looking at the stakeholders' impact on the user's behavior, and really doing quite a lot of research at that at that part at that stage so for me i would say it's from the very beginning we need to work with the users and the people that affect their behavior such as the stakeholders i mentioned and engage with them to say this is the problem we've, this is the problem we've seen um how do you define it what motivates you to change your behavior what prevents you from changing your behavior and engage them with the whole design process um so from the whole definition of the problem or the suggestion of the problem and researching them to actually really define it better and get the design criteria, even in work with them through the ideas, the concepts, the prototyping, the testing and in using a lean um, method, as I mentioned before, I think that's really key. So throughout the summary is my answer. I've got 12 more questions. Let's see if we can get through these. So Connor, um, do you believe that the fundamental change required to adopt the circuit economy model in all slash more slash key issues is likely to come from the government pulling <coughs> legislation or by consumer push. And do you believe this will happen quickly enough to avoid climate disaster? Um, great question. All these questions have been really great. I would say it is, um, again, this is my opinion, it's not a fact. I would say, to be honest, they both have to work together. So if you look at that in terms of the government pushing legislation, you could say it is like a top-down approach potentially to an extent, and you could say consumer pool. Um, yeah, consumer pool isn't exactly bottom up, but it is trying to say by working with the users, maybe the users being able to lobby or the users um, changing their behaviour patterns and how they use things. How can that enable change? If we look at what's been happening with, um, the, the, I won't, I might not pronounce her name correctly, but the. <coughs> the younger girl who's currently really pushing for people to change the way they respond to climate change and is really uh, even encouraged quite a few of the younger generation a range of schools around in her particular that country to stop going to school and say no we are we are really fed up of what is going on and we do not want it to continue and we want things to change they're really lobbying the, they like not even just lobbying the government they're really trying to shout loud and encourage us as um, the people who are in power, so when I say maybe the older people who are who are the ones who are 
going on the planes, who are the people who are driving the cars that typically will um, raise concern about when they're considering um, carbon emissions. What do we actually need to do? So when they, so I think looking at the consumer, if the consumer is able to really um, shout about their problem and um, really challenge mindsets, then that sometimes put, does push the government. And then when the government is able to listen, then you believe legislation can change and then policy can change, and then it could be frittled through to throughout society. So that's a model that's often used. And I think that's a really key one to kind of look at. It's not just saying the government knows to do it, but how do we as a consumer really actually, I'm not saying do anything um, <laughs> necessarily negative, but how can we really say, okay, no, I'm really standing against this. And I think that does enable change because really the climate, um, in terms of climate change and all the all these things we've known about this. I've, I'm not going to say my age, but I've known about this from very young. I currently work with schools um, around the UK to actually really try to say to them, what do we need to do to design more sustainably? How do you consider materials? How do you consider waste? And being able to work with people like the consumer from the like a bottom up approach is really important. But if the government aren't on board, then it just sometimes it feels like an effort that it's like a glass ceiling. So it's like, I think it's really important we both work together to be able to avoid a climate disaster and really engage with the younger generation because they're going to be the ones who are going to have to deal with a lot of these challenges. I've got even more questions now, so I'm really sorry I won't be able to get through all of this. Um, let's see. So, uh, let's see, this one says, from, so Nicholas, Hopefully I've said that okay. Is the plastic recycling technology mature enough for investors to consider investing in plastic um, recycling plants? Um, okay, I think, so okay, this, I would say that the plastic recycling technology is quite mature, um, not even quite mature, it is very mature, but it actually has inherent problems. The energy required to recycle um, plastics um, across the across the spectrum, so obviously, you know, there's a wide range of <coughs> plastics when you consider plastics. So depending on whether it's, um, depending on the form of plastic, it impacts whether it actually can even be recycled and also impacts how much energy is required to recycle the product itself. So a HDP compared to LDP, et cetera. Um, I think it is quite mature, but I think it's really impor important to realize that inherently there's a lot of energy, is an, inherently there's a lot of challenges because there's a lot of energy that's put in to recycle um, plastics and it isn't as easy as we would think. Um, so I would say that investors could consider, but I think in, consider investing in recycling plastic, plastic, but I think it's even more important to consider how we can redesi redesign plastics so we use less, less material and less energy content is even put into creating the plastic product itself, but also really trying to think about how do you address it as us as consumers to be able to reuse plastics more so less plastics are put into the um, race stream like like just so we're actually really addressing the root cause okay so um so this is from georgina so the clue so i'm going to try and i should i think i said it correctly on the um on the webinar so the color case study is very interesting what are your thoughts on how to make the model make the sharing that sharing slash service model work in larger scale industries such as infrastructure building, etc., where component design lives are longer. Felix Lighting are looking at the paper lux model. Um, so I would say that I'm hopefully not going to refer back to too much what I've said previously, but I would say that larger infrastructure companies being able to do this. It really, I actually, I'm going to, have to use the word again. I think it really does highlight, it really do need to consider behavioral change. So it's really making, ensuring that the different parties that we need to be able to share are open and really to share. And I think a key driver is the bottom line. And if that behavioral change is ready and they're able to collaboratively do this, then I think it's really important when you do co design solution that you all get them all engaged, they all have they all have significant certain amount of buy-in and you've also considered all the different um it's quite a multifaceted approach so whatever or consider all the factors that maybe prevent them from saying yes i'm going to go in and um agree with this kind of sharing economy type model and then another key thing is really looking at how you can use digital technology in a really um efficient manner to be able to really empower this approach to 
um, be success successful and also implemented in a manner that works because I think in terms of when you're for thinking things such as component design or when you're thinking of I'm not sure what the Philips lighting model is or paper lux um, if you don't think about when one person's used it when how does the next person need to collect it and that being able to create all that infrastructure to, for it to work really well I think you really do need to use data and you need to think about how you can um, visualize it digitally and how you can really react to change and how people can see what's occurring um, I think it's all possible but I think data and digital technology and visualization is really key and as I mentioned before really trying to co-design and work collaboratively so everybody engages so next person is um, Joanna. Thank you for the presentation. How do you go about finding the facility around the area which undergo recycling? Um, I Google. <laughs> I hope that helps. Um, so I Google, and um, that's basically it. And sometimes things like my previously, I move. I'm in London. It might be tough from my accent from South London. I move from a di to a different part of South London, which didn't recycle. Um, I've got a combo particular product to recycle, and then I just re I googled and realised um, that there's a I think it was like a Sainsbury's I could go to and drop some of my material in there. So that's, if that helps, but that's really bring it down to just a really basic level. I just googled. Google is a very powerful thing. Um, you could probably also look at your local authority. I'm sure there's other areas, other areas to find it as well. Um, so Eric, sorry, I've got another ten questions. So I might not be able to get through. So I'm just going to go to Eric's. So Eric Yates, how does the individual engineer, small business, cut through the fog of big business politicians, big corporations who, one, brand your evidence as fake news, very true, two, continue to manufacture products which cannot be repaired, three, make no provision for taking back packaging so that they force, so they force themselves to get packaging right and so and in the best interest of, of all of us. Um, Eric, I really agree with a lot of the things you said, and I'm going to try and, I think, Eric, you might be the last answer in the next, unless I can extend the time for the next three minutes. Um, I think a really key thing, even though I may really be pushing things such as the UK Plastics Pact, um, because I really am for collaborations, because I think that really enables change. I think a really key area is to look at what you said in terms of branded evidence as fake news. So. For things, for fake news to become real news, I think obviously you can have the facts, we can get the data, we can do the research, we can lobby the government, but we also need to have the people on board. So I'm not going to name anybody's name, but if the if the people in power don't believe in what we're saying, then you don't get the change. So in terms of things that are occurring occurring now, like the um, going back to plastic, so looking at the single use plastic bags, um, we've known for very long what the challenges that are, have occurred with recycling plastics, but now things are changing occurred so this data was never a lie but it's more that now the people who needed to be to be engaged in the conversation were engaged and they implemented the change to enable the other um, greater members of the audience or the um, members of public to engage number two continue to manufacture products that cannot be repaired yet I think it's really important that if that people need to um, be enforced or the government need to encourage more companies to be able to if we do have something like the if we do have a pact so we do have any other legislation that's in place any collaborative um um goals or such as sustainable development goals then we really need the government to really get the manufacturers on board and that's really important there's something called the created to grave certification i only recently found out about it and it's trying to encourage more people to get into a certain economy type kind of um model in terms of the businesses this is a great certification but it hasn't really been pushed i well in my opinion i don't think a lot of people who are even engaged in the circular economy know of this but who should really be pushing it um should it be the government should it be the institutes of Eng engineering institutes who should really be pushing these kind of things that are maybe certifications that mean that you need to be able to manufacture products so they can be repaired and it's as simple as that um but again that would be the big push and a collaborative approach Make no provisions for taking back packaging so that they force them, themselves to get packaging right and in the best interest of interest for all of us, as what you just said. Um, yeah, I think, like I was saying, it has to be something that the that there, there is like a policy that is enforced and hope and believe in that policy that is enforced is something that um, will be enforced in a manner that hurts the bottom line because um, that often things change. But also really trying to not just... Um, 
do like scaremongering, but saying actually looking at how the circular economy model does actually improve your bottom line and it also improves how you look. So you're, by you being, for lack of a better word, greener, that actually looks good and it actually is the right thing to do in terms of stewarding the earth. We only have a certain amount of uh, resources, it's a finite, finite um, earth we're living in, so it's really important that these businesses also realise that it's not just about not looking bad, it's actually good to look good. Um, I think we're out of time. I'll just check if I can give it any other time. Um, but I think we are out, out of time, so I think I'll have to sadly some, bring it all to a close. What I can say is that you can definitely feel free to email me. My email address is marie at dreamnetworks.co.uk. Um, it's been really great to speak to you all about this really interesting topic. I do know there's other questions. I really wish I could answer them, but I know it's a, a limited time for this particular webinar. But we can collate the questions and potentially even send the responses after. Feel free to email me. Um, feel free to even my my social. Well, I can be engaged with on Twitter via my social enterprise. So that's at DN Love Plays. Um, I, just I didn't actually mention my social enterprise really focuses on how do you um, work with businesses and um, communities and schools to really engage them to collectively see how they can collaboratively address the challenge we have with designing playgrounds and particularly think about how can you use sustainable resources, sustainable materials and how can we engage with the designers, so the children in themselves to be able to create play areas that are sustainable. So that's why everything that you might find out about me more recently is to do play because I, I focus on play um, but thank you all for your time and all the best in the future and I'm looking forward to finding out all, or seeing all the great things you do to try and really enable more of a more circular approach to be put in place in the world using the tools that we have as engineers which is creativity and innovation thank you very much <laughs>